The Red Bull RB16B. The name's a bit of a giveaway. The 2021 Red Bull is a gentle evolution of last year's Red Bull RB16. But that doesn't mean it isn't packed with lots of interesting details and features. For what may be the fastest or even the second fastest car on the grid this year, the car is full of little secrets and little innovations. And I thought we'd take a detailed look at some of them. The first of these innovations that I wanted to take a look at was actually spotted by one of our cameramen and he got in touch with us last year and said have a look at this. And he noticed a fluid connector that runs from the front bulkhead into the nose of the car. This doesn't make a lot of sense because in the nose structure of the cars there isn't much at all other than a crash structure so it didn't really make sense that there was a liquid connector going down there. What we believe to be the case, though we're not 100% certain, is that the driver's drinks bottle is located near the tip of the nose of the Red Bull RB16 and RB16B and fed back through that tube into the cockpit when the, a little motor when, fires up when the driver presses his button. Well, what this could mean is that as the driver drinks during a race, the, that, that bottle gets a bit emptier and that shifts the weight distribution of the car rearwards. Now, don't forget that in 2021, like all recent years, the weight distribution of Formula One cars is very strictly regulated. So as the fuel tank empties, it could be that as the driver drinks the drinks bottle, he helps move the weight distribution or at least keep it in the area where the team really need it to make those Pirelli tires really work. Now, what we don't know is if the driver has a little bit of a boo-boo early in the race and knocks the nose off or the team have to change it, does the new nose have a completely full drinks bottle in it or does the driver just have to go without for the rest of the race? That's something we aren't entirely sure about either, but we're going to be looking back at later in the season and hopefully the team will let us take a more detailed look at just how that system really works. One area that a lot of teams have been spending a lot of time and effort and design changes on have been the front brake ducts and it's pretty much the same story at Red Bull. Teams have been spending a lot of time on these areas, it's a completely new shape for 2021. The reason being is they have a massive aerodynamic influence on what's behind them, the barge boards and the floor. Well Red Bull have been mucking about between from race to race, they've been looking at uh, the different so well, scalloping, if you like, or different segments within the front brake ducts, you can see here, they have a more complicated version for different downforce demands. And I think that's something that's not so much to do with brake cooling, it's more to do with handling the airflow around the front tire and just getting interacting with the barge boards, just how the car really needs it to be for those particular circuit types. So with that in mind, it's probably no great surprise that the barge boards have also been a big area of development for Red Bull, though perhaps not as big as it has been for some teams. The 2020 concept has continued. In Bahrain, this was the version used by Sergio Perez, and then in Portugal, a more advanced version was fitted to both cars, including this version on Max Verstappen's car with these longer longitudinal slats. This gives, this is again all to do with managing the floor and the flow conditions around the rear of the floor. Just note those uh, uh, that array of bits that stick up from the floor. Can't think of a good name for those. Um, moving on though, the rear of the floor itself is an absolute, well, it's exactly where everybody's been putting all of the effort. The new rules, you lost that segment out of the side of the floor and teams have found ways around it to really you know, maximize the airflow in this area of the car. And here you can see Red Bull started the season with a pretty straightforward version, though far more complex than some teams have used. And then they went for this stepped floor. Now Craig Scarborough and I spoke about how those stepped floors works in a previous episode, so you can look that up. But Red Bull have gone into a bit more detail there in the centre segment of the floor. And I don't think the work is all finished there. Though at Monaco, that is the floor that was fitted to the car. I think there may be one or two more iterations to come as Red Bull still try to master the airflow around the inner face of that rear tyre and seal the edge of the diffuser. Now I mentioned the diffuser because that the rear of the Red Bull is where most of the interesting bits to talk about are. So I thought we'd take a much closer look at the rear of the Red Bull RB16B. Now key to the rear end concept of the Red Bull is something that's been key to all of the Red Bull family of cars for some time. Here you can see the Alpha Tauri, which is based on the Red Bull RB15, quite frankly, and the Red Bull RB16B. Their rake angle, that's the rear ride height between the two cars compared. Now it's not an exact light for light comparison because the camera angles aren't exactly the same, but you can both see how high the rear ends of the cars are. Now if we compare the Alpha Tauri, which is a high rake angle car to that of the Mercedes, a long wheelbase, 
low rake angle car. Look how much longer the Mercedes is compared to the Alfa Tauri. That's quite an important point. There's hardly, has hardly any difference between the front and rear ride height. There's a little bit, but that rake angle is much lower. Now, the change in rake angle year on year has really helped out Red Bull because the team already ran this high rake concept. And the new regulations meant that that rear downforce loss was much lower for Red Bull than it was for, say, Mercedes or Aston Martin, who also run this low rear ride height. And that's given the team a little bit of an advantage. But that's not all of Red Bull's advantage explained this season. Most of the interest in Red Bull's rear end has been focused on something else, but something that popped up during the practice sessions at the Monaco Grand Prix, I thought I had to show you here on the diffuser. Now, you can just about see it on the screen there. These, uh, the two central sections of the diffuser have serrated edges, a bit like a steak knife, if you like. Well, these are metal inserts that the team have fitted to the diffuser, and I think those little serrations essentially give the effect of extending the diffuser ever so slightly. It can be slightly draggy to do things like that and low observable on radar probably however I think on a circuit like Monaco that could give a little bit of a gain and it's all of these marginal gains adding up that make the difference to a car's pace around the lap just a fascinating little innovation from Red Bull for the Monaco Grand Prix It'd be interesting to see if they keep it for the rest of the season the single biggest difference between the RB16 and the RB16B is here at the rear of the car, the rear suspension. Now, the rear suspension arrangement on the RB16B has been subtly changed. The inboard suspension points have been moved around a little bit, and that means only one thing. Red Bull have spent their two upgrade tokens on a new transmission casing. Now, this isn't about making the rear of the car stiffer or just about changing those suspension arms. That's something the team probably thought about doing, but the big reason that Red Bull started to do this was because last year they discovered that the car had a handling imbalance. Now, that handling imbalance wasn't down to the suspension design as I understand it, it was down to something on the rear end of the car, the gearbox pickup points. Now, by moving those inboard suspension points, Red Bull were able to make that car handle properly. Alpha Tauri, who were following Red Bull's RB15 and some of the RB16 concept, decided not to adopt the Red Bull 2020 gearbox for this exact reason. They knew that something to do with that gearbox casing caused the car to handle badly. So when Red Bull went moved to the new 2021 gearbox, Alpha Tauri opted to stick to the 2019 gearbox to avoid any moments like you saw with Max Verstappen in Hungary on that lap to the pits where he managed to put the car in the wall and then requiring a new nose cone. And when he did that, it may have meant on that slightly soggy day in Hungary, Max Verstappen's throat might have been quite dry because there may have been no drinks bottle in that new nose cone. Of course, the biggest talking point so far about the Red Bull this season has been about its rear wing. At the Spanish Grand Prix, during the three practice sessions, Red Bull introduced a new rear wing onto its car. The design was quite noticeably different. You can see the new one closest to me here on the screen with that pretty flat dish section in the middle and then the more standard you know, race section in the middle version that used in free practice two in Spain. And you can see on the screen there slightly that there's a slight different performance characteristic between these two wings. Now, that raised some eyebrows up and down the pit lane and certainly caught quite a lot of interest. And to discuss a little bit more about what we're seeing here, I'm gonna ask Craig Scarborough to come and join me. One of the biggest talking points across the Spanish Grand Prix weekend was Red Bull Racing's new rear wing. And the reason for that, Craig, was what we're about to see as the cars go down on track. You've got the Mercedes on one side of your screen and the Honda-powered Red Bull on the other side. Now, you can see the yellow line, which is the starting position of the top of the Red Bull rear wing. And you can see as the car accelerates down the straight and the forces build up on that rear wing, it starts to deform, it starts to drop away. The Mercedes rear wing also does the same because you expect, if you get on an aeroplane, you can see wings deforming under load. But what we're seeing here is, it became a talking point after Lewis Hamilton raised it in a few press conferences. And it's not something a driver could see, so it had been highlighted to him by one of his engineers. Now, what are we seeing here? Why is this happening? OK, so what we're seeing here is you're seeing the, the Red Bull rear wing and the Mercedes rear wing appearing to go lower as we go down the straight and then before they start braking it kind of pops back up again and this is all to do with the the downforce that they're creating at the high speed that the load is getting higher and higher on the wing and they're they're, they're flexing and you know engineering standard term is nothing can be infinitely stiff and therefore 
things will move as you put more pressure on them. Um, but what you're actually seeing here isn't just that the wing's moving down, it's the manner in which they're um, moving. So they're actually twisting backwards slightly. And this is the important thing that's going on here because this has a potential aerodynamic advantage for the team. Yeah, this sort of aeroelasticity, as some engineers like to call it, I like that phrase, um, <laughs> is also do sometimes with reduce, reducing drag as the car goes down the straight. So the car's building up speed, by the wing dropping back, it's reducing that aerodynamic air resistance, the aerodynamic drag, and that allows the car to have a higher top speed at the end of the straight, which is worth lap time. But to be able to do this, you need to build up a certain amount of load across the wing. Now, the teams have to work quite hard on this because this is a regulated area, isn't it, Craig? Yes, I mean, this has been going on for, for decades in Formula One, all sorts of trickery and things going on, and the FIA have you know, consistently acted to stop this. So they have tests, which they do uh, in scrutineering during the weekend, and you can't really see it here, but there's also um, a template that goes around the wing that prevents the top flap moving relative to the main plane. So there's lots of ways that this is being measured. So again, it's something the FA are more than aware of. Yeah, and if you, if you didn't have a degree of flexibility in the wings, they'd quite simply just snap because the forces would exceed, the, you know, the, uh, as you say, it cannot be infinitely stiff. So there is always going to be some flexibility in all of the bodywork. And if you just want to watch a, a camera where you can see a T-wing on the pit lane channel or something, you can see them flapping around all over the place. But Craig, you've had a little bit more of a detailed look at just how these changes have been happening, not just on the Red Bull, but just in general on all Formula One cars and racing cars going back over the years and how these wings deform. So what I've got here is I've got a drawing of a generic rear wing uh, from a Formula One car and you can see the setup that you've got here. So you've got the wing itself, um, you've got the end plates which are there obviously to manage the pressure difference uh, above and below the wing. But nowadays wings are mounted not by the end plates but what they're known as swan neck mounts and obviously they're called swan necks because they quite literally look like swan's neck. Um, and these are the things that actually transfer the load from the wing into the chassis of the car. And it sits on the gearbox casing, so that's why that's such an important part of the car. We, you know, we've talked about the Red Bull new gearbox casing. That, the gearbox casing is linked directly to the back of the engine, which is directly linked to the monocoque, so it's the big spine of the car. So that puts the load directly into the spine of the car. The regulations say you're not allowed to put those wing forces directly into the uprights, the unsprung part of the car. Mm -hmm. That's for safety reasons. That was banned, I think, in 1968 after a number of wing Wings failures ended quite one. nastily in, in Harama in Spain. So uh, they cannot mount them directly to the uprights like some Formula student teams do, but they can mount directly to the gearbox casing. Exactly. So you would have thought that with the amount of force that the wing is generating that these would be, again, very, very stiff. But the way they're now designed is that there's effectively a pivot line going through them. There is some ability for the wing to be able to rotate around these mounts. And what then happens is that this whole top section of wing on the top half of the end plate is able to twist backwards slightly. And I've got another picture to kind of show you the potential difference here. So this is now the wing in the deflected state. So this is what you would have at high speed, you know, over 250 kph now. That's that kind of level where you don't need the maximum downforce from the rear wing anymore. And you can see with this yellow area how far the wing has tipped back. Now this equates to a, potentially a couple of degrees of angle of attack in the rear wing, which reduces downforce. Obviously you don't need it in a straight line to such an extent, but as you say, the most important thing, this is now winding back the wing angle, which is greatly reduces your drag. Obviously, rear wings are great for going around corners, but they're a real hindrance going fast in a straight line. Ideally, you'd want a mix of both when you can't be operating DRS. So having this rotate backwards slightly is a way of being able to still have a relatively stiff setup, but gain some potential advantage on the straights. Yeah, because if you didn't have this, as I said, you wouldn't be able to run certain shapes of wing. Now, there's no suggestion that what's being, what we're seeing on some of the cars up and down the grid is actually outside of the regulations, but we have heard that the FI do want to take a slightly closer look at it using the onboard cameras. Yeah, so the problem you have is that the way the tests work at the moment is they actually attach a rig to the wing and try and pull it down. Now, these are point loads as much as they try to spread them, because obviously the entire wing is subject to the aero forces. You can't recreate that in the scrutineering, but you can actually see what's going on, as those previous clips showed us. So they're looking at a much more optical way of seeing what this movement is, uh, is going on 
and if there is any need to control it. Well, going forwards, there's going to be communication between the FIA and the teams about how much movement on the rear wing is going to be acceptable. It's obvious that it's impossible for there to be no movement, so it's just about how they measure that, how they work that through. And for the teams now, it could become quite a major challenge to ensure that there isn't the movement that the FIA aren't happy with, and there's no suggestion anyone's done anything anybody's unhappy with at the moment. And if that is the situation, they may have to spend some more of their wind tunnel time, which don't forget is strictly regulated this year on developing new rear wing packages. Difficult for the teams, but great for us on Tech Talk. Thanks for joining us and hopefully we'll see some more exciting bits and pieces as the season goes on.